is Roger Brewer and John Fear with the Hawaii Department of Health. This is the first presentation in a series of four presentations on the implementation of decision unit and multi-increment sample or DUMIS site investigation methods. Our primary reference for these presentations will be the Hawaii Technical Guidance Manual or TGM. So you hear us refer to this throughout these webinars and you see a, a web link here to access the TGM. A TGM is in, on, in PDF format if you want to download the TGM or you can also look at it in web-based format. The prim there's three primary sections in the TGM that cover DUMIS site investigation methods. And section three of the TGM covers systematic planning of site investigations or how you lay a, out a site investigation to begin with. There's also a section that discusses decision units. This is something, it's actually a familiar idea, but the term will be new to a lot of people who haven't been doing this in the past. And there's also a small section on report preparation. Uh, section four of the TGM discusses sampling theory and the use of multi-increment versus discrete samples to characterize a decision unit. Section five of the TGM covers the field collection of soil and sediment samples using multi-increment sampling methods and also a discussion of field documentation. A section eight of the TGM covers the use of field screening methods and especially including the use of a portable XRF to characterize decision units under an MI investigation. So today's the first webinar, and this uh, today John Peard is going to review section or chapter three of a TGM, systematic planning and site investigation design. So again, discover the basics of how you set up a site investigation to begin with. A lot of this will be familiar. There'll be some new added things that deal with decision and multi increment sample investigations. Tomorrow, then I'll be covering decision unit designations, and once you get the hang of how to collect samples, multi increment samples, it really comes down to how you designate your decision units in the field to characterize. And John will be discussing that. So a decision that you hear this term a lot is simply the volume, area and volume of soil at a site that you would send to the laboratory as a single sample if you could. That's usually not possible. So you have to collect a representative sample. And that's all part of multi increment sampling approaches. On Wednesday, and I'll come back, I'll be discussing sampling theory and getting into more detail on discrete versus multi-increment sampling methods. And we'll review a field study we did of discrete sample reliability. And this will again address chapter four in the TGM. On the fourth day, then John will be back. He'll be discussing the field implementation of decision unit MIS methods. So with that, I'll pass it off to John to start the first webinar. Aloha, I'm John Peard with the Department of Health here office. I'm going to provide you a little background on how our DUMIS guidance was developed over the years, as well as cover basic systematic planning elements for, these, for our DUMIS investigation. This includes an initial discussion on selection of decision units, but Roger will be covering in-depth decision unit selection examples, etc., in tomorrow's webinar. So be sure to join in there as well. This slide depicts the former sugarcane growing areas on our four largest Hawaiian islands uh, during the period about 1920 to 1937. This time, inorganic arsenic was utilized as a primary herbicide uh, for growing sugar cane. You can see many uh, hundreds of thousands of acres across the uh, islands at that time were in sugar cane where arsenic, inorganic arsenic may have been used. In 2004, our office began targeted efforts to investigate soil arsenic contamination issues related to these sugar cane operations. And it was during these operations, uh, these investigations, that we recognized the need for more reliable representative sampling methods than discrete sampling methods that were utilized at the time for adequately characterizing soil remediation for risk assessment. We had uh, 
In, in particular, we had one site that where we discovered on the island of Hawaii in which uh, we discovered very extreme variability in heterogeneity across the site. So about a four acre site and depending on where you took a discrete sample, we could have a thousand fold variation of what that level might be. We realized quickly that if we used discrete sampling methods, especially if we didn't use lots and lots of discrete samples across that, that site, that our samples would not be representative and if we chose different discrete samples, we could get a different answer every time that we chose to do that. So we began a search of other uh, alternate methods and the one we uh, landed on, identified and landed on, was the uh, a sampling method called the G sampling theory that was developed in the field of geology and uh, also used pretty widely in the field of agri agriculture and, and nutrient sampling and agriculture. And fortunately for us, uh, Chuck Ramsey of Envirostatic Consultant was providing uh, excellent training on multi-increment sampling methods. So that began our efforts to learn a new method and apply a new method in the state of Hawaii. Here are uh, key time periods over the last uh, dozen years really in which uh, we developed our uh, decision unit multi-increment sampling guidance. As I noted in 2004 is when we first uh, uh, were perplexed with the use of uh, discrete sampling to adequately characterize uh, arsenic in, in sites on the Hawaii Island. That led to uh, identifying a new sampling method, uh, multi-increment sampling, and during the years 2005 to 2007, we uh, conducted field work utilizing MIS as well as provided training on MI, MIS methods through uh, Chuck Ramsey and Virostat Incorporated to our staff, environmental consultants in the state, and to uh, labs in the state. But I would say the major challenge uh, during that our initial use of DU MIS methods was the decision unit selection. It's a key part and how uh, how to make the decision unit selection. The decision unit is uh, the area in which we, we need a representative contaminant level to make a decision. And we, how, how we select that for environmental work as opposed to how it was applied in other fields like geology and uh, agriculture. So a key aspect of this is selecting your decision unit, making it relevant to risk assessment and your risk assessors working on your team so that the, uh, the final answer, uh, the, the average contaminant level that you get for your decision unit is appro appropriate for decision making and, and uh, decisions on the site. In 2008, we developed our first guidance for the use of DUMIS soil sampling and posted it to our online technical guidance manual. This included guidance that was applicable to all chemicals of concern that, that we were uh, dealing with. Uh, most contaminated sites in Hawaii are small and the most common contaminants evaluated include petroleum, arsenic, lead, dioxin, PCBs, or mercury. Then in, uh, as in the following years through 2010 and 11, we, we posted up additional guidance uh, providing more details on subsurface soil sampling procedures using DUMIS, stockpile sampling, uh, the, the special issue of VOC sampling and lab, lab processing of, of DU multi-increment samples. Finally, in 2016, we posted uh, updates to our TGM guidance throughout sections three, four, and five in our online TGM. And this included updates uh, and additional examples from the eight years of experience since we uh, first adopted the procedure 
in the state and uh, provided much more detail in which we're uh, trying to present uh, a summary of that additional detail and guidance for you in this series of workshops. I'd also mention that um, during the over this time period, uh, we weren't the only ones working on uh, multi-increment sampling in the environmental field, certainly. And even back in 2004, there were some noted documents uh, using the same sampling theory, this G sampling theory, uh, as guidance. I would say uh, of significance is the EPA, the 2003 EPA guidance for obtaining representative laboratory subsamples for particulate laboratory samples. This applied to the laboratory end of sampling particulate samples, but uh, it, based on the G sampling theory, has an excellent section discussing the G sampling theory in general and uh, was an excellent document about how to apply this for the laboratory environment. Unfortunately, the guidance was never incorporated systematically into the SW846 methods, so uh, not everybody uh, in many labs uh, never heard, of, heard about it or were not familiar with this uh, guidance. In addition, the ASTM guidance at that time in 2003, the Standard Guide for Lab Subsampling of Media Related to Waste Management activities was also based on the G sampling theory and included uh, significant uh, multi-increment sampling procedures in the, the lab, sub lab subsampling protocols at that time. Uh, of note is, of special note is also in 2006, the EPA analytical method 8 8330B, 8330B for explosives was published, and this is the first and only so far EPA analytical method that incorporates guidance for use of MIS methods in both the lab and the uh, field collection of samples. The field uh, sampling guidance is provided in Appendix A of that method. And uh, of course, this is for sampling explosives on uh, military ranges. So that was a significant uh, document incorporating the, the same MIS uh, sampling theory. In 2007, Alaska published draft guidance for using MIS for petroleum samples. So that was also out there during, um, during that time period. And I another significant document was in 2012 the ITRC published a useful sampling guidance called incremental sampling methodology so they call it incremental sampling as opposed to multi-increment sampling but uh, it was based on the same sampling theory and had a lot of the same elements as included in um, our guidance although it's not the same in all respects as uh, the, the uh, Department of Health guidance for the state of Hawaii. The TGM Section 3 covers the site investigation design and implement implementation elements for an investigation using DU MIS procedures. And of special note, um, are the sections on selection of decision units. Again, uh, all important uh, decision for environmental work is what are, what are your decision units for making, making uh, contaminant decisions. So that is unique to this uh, site investigation design guidance. Also, there's lots of examples included in that section of decision units and how, how they're applied in site investigations. And the DUMIS investigation protocols also sprinkled through, of course, in the sampling analysis plan element, element 3.6 here, incorporating the actual sampling procedures uh, 
doing DUMIS sampling in the field, how to collect samples, how to use proper tools to collect appropriate samples, et cetera. And then in quality assurance and data quality assessment, importantly with this method is incorporating a true field replicates, which uh, generally were not conducted with discrete sampling methods into each investigation so that we can get uh, we have site-specific precision data on the sampling uh, for every investigation. These are key systematic planning approach elements uh, for for any investigation. You might be uh, you'll be generally familiar with these uh, concepts. Uh, typically called the data quality objective, these especially items one through five you'll recognize as uh, very similar to the EPA data quality objectives uh, elements. Again, the decision, the defining of the decision units is uh, particularly important and, and unique within uh, incorporating the, the DUMIS procedure and in step item six of the systematic planning approach here, sampling and analysis and collection of samples. Of course, uh, this includes both lab and field procedures and the incorporation of, of MIS procedures and during your field collection as well as uh, these same uh, pr MIS principles and uh, processes for for the lab analyses of your samples. The uh, step seven or eight, uh, where, which are typically uh, the sort of the data assessment elements here, again, these are similar to what you might uh, be familiar with uh, in any state or, uh, or the federal uh, environmental investigation procedures. The very unique characteristics of DUMIS uh, are included here in the data evaluation. As I said, we, we're providing uh, true field replicates, so that's incorporated in this data evaluation in both the field and the lab data. So more detail on some of the systematic planning elements, uh, in beginning on your site investigation and gathering your background information, phase one environmental assessment type data. Just wanted to mention in, in our investigations here, uh, the, some of the key elements that have been critical in identifying sites and uh, getting background on sites for our investigations have been the use of historic uh, aerial photos as well as historic uh, Sanborn maps, which are fire insurance maps that were developed in uh, industrial areas that give uh, include diagrams that label buildings and, and uses of buildings. In, in the example given here, the uh, a poison shed is is identified on a Sanborn map, and then we could go to corresponding historical photo, find that uh, poison mixing shed, and so we can target that for sampling. And then also shown on the map was a cane seed dipping vat in which uh, mercury issues and, and other uh, fungicide related chemicals could be of concern. So. Again, the Sanborn maps and historical area photos have been critical in, in identifying problems. The other uh, big factor has been interview with workers. It's in invaluable to get workers uh, if, if they're still available. Now, some of these former uh, sugarcane facilities, have, they left the islands many years ago, and workers that were familiar with the sites are are quite aged now, they're in their 80s or 90s in some cases, and so um, it's critical to get people who can still recall uh, these sites if they're available and have worked in the area, get them 
in our vehicles and out to the sites to provide uh, background information on the sites to help us select uh, decision units and identify the areas that are targeted for investigation. Conceptual site models are the first uh, step in the uh, systematic planning process. Uh, a conceptual site model helps to identify contaminants of potential concern and their, their associated environmental hazards. A number of those hazards are uh, identified here, direct exposure, vapor intrusion, drinking water toxicity, gross contamination, leaching, et cetera, then you'll be, uh, you'll be generally familiar with these environmental hazards. And the conceptual site model uh, brings those, uh, those hazards together uh, as an initial step to conceptualize the environmental issues on the site, sometimes referred to as exposure pathways analysis uh, because it includes contaminant migration pathways uh, and site-specific receptors that might uh, in, in encounter the environmental hazards that are identified. And it can, uh, an initial site assessment can help uh, demonstrate data gaps that need to be investigated and filled. Uh, when, when evaluating receptors, it's important to uh, uh, also identify current land use zoning and anticipated future land use and zoning to adequately uh, assess the site. Here's another sample conceptual site model in a uh, tabular format. Uh, as the uh, pictorial conceptual site model, it includes sources, uh, release mechanisms, potential hazards, and whether it's uh, potentially present under current or, or planned future land uses. In the state of Hawaii, we have several default scenarios that are used in setting our environmental action levels used to ev evaluate sites uh, once we have representative data for the site. And, uh, these are a critical part of the conceptual site models. That, and these two factors include, is the site located within 150 meters of a surface water body or sensitive aquatic habitat or not? And also, is the site uh, located in an area where groundwater is a current or potential drinking water source or a non-drinking water source? So these factors are, are uh, default site scenarios in which we have separate uh, environmental action levels designed, uh, in some cases uh, separate EALs for these different characteristics. Another uh, site characteristic that, that we have uh, different EALs identified for some sites include whether the site is residential use, uh, unrestricted or residential use, and then whether it's commercial industrial use. So there can be different uh, action levels, default action levels for those two different types of use. But as uh, across the board, we initial, initially evaluate all sites for un, uh, with our unrestricted use or our residential use action levels. and. Uh, identify hazards there and then move forward. Here again are the uh, key environmental concerns that, that uh, we evaluate for setting our default EALs, uh, our Tier 1 EALs as we call them, and these include uh, for soil key environmental hazards like direct exposure, vapor intrusion, gross contamination, leaching, and typically uh, terrestrial habitats are site-specific, so uh, that will depend on whether there's significant terrestrial habitat 
on there and typically handled through an eco risk assessment. So that's a little bit separate, but for these other hazards, we, we have uh, EALs for, for uh, each of our over 100 you know, chemicals of concern developed for each of these uh, ha environmental hazards that apply to that chemical. And then on with groundwater, the same sort of thing. We have EALs for drinking water toxicity, vapor intrusion, gross contamination, aquatic habitats, uh, as they might apply for a, a given site. Typically, the, the hazard then Typically, the hazard that uh, is identified with the lowest applicable EAL then uh, drives the site in terms of uh, the risk and the, the assessment. However, some sites can have multiple hazards that are of concern and need to be tracked over time. Our environmental action levels are uh, in our a uh, document called Environmental Hazards at Sites with Contaminated Soil and, and Groundwater. This is in a separate uh, document on our website. The link is given here on this slide. And again, this provides EALs for uh, hundreds of different chemicals for soil, soil vapor, indoor air, groundwater. It's in a easy to use format in a, in a large uh, series of Excel tables that you can navigate uh, in minutes to identify uh, environmental hazards associated with certain levels of contaminants. So once you have representative data, you can uh, then use that data uh, to identify whether our uh, tier one environmental action levels have been exceeded or not. Again, you need representative soil sampling for the site and the DUs you're evaluating for uh, for these environmental action levels uh, to be properly evaluated. One last comment about uh, environmental hazards. Uh, as I mentioned, some, ha some hazards uh, are unique to a certain types or families of chemicals and, and others uh, uh, have multiple environmental concerns. In some of our most common contaminants, like arsenic, uh, organoclam pesticides, dioxins, PCBs, direct exposure concerns are generally uh, drive the the environmental concerns and therefore the decisions on the site. With other chemicals, uh, in notably uh, gasoline uh, or diesel-related contaminants or some solvents. Uh, multiple environmental hazards may be identified and potentially driving the site, leaching, vapor emission, and gross contamination depending on the, the exact chemical in these families. And multiple hazards then need to be tracked and evaluated uh, for uh, the site. And the levels, uh, the, the, ac the average residues on the site may trigger concerns for multiple hazards uh, on a given site. All right, into our site investigation process. Of, of course, you want to make clear site investigation objectives, and, and key among those is has a release occurred. So obviously, we're trying to document that our uh, whether a significant release is, has occurred, and if a release has occurred, did it result in, in residues in your decision units that uh, exceed our Tier 1 EALs? So that's the basic uh, objective in, in our most investigations in the state. To do that, you need to estimate the lateral and vertical extent of contamination and then uh, once that is accomplished, you can evaluate the potential environmental hazards associated with those contaminant levels. And then again, that can be used then to make recommendations to optimize uh, 
any remedial, remedial actions that may be appropriate for, for contaminants that exceed our applicable action limits, and for confirmation uh, of site that a site is clean after site remediation has occurred. Again, a decision unit is a specific area, vol a vo depth, area and depth or volume of soil for which a representative average contaminant con concentration is of interest and uh, will be determined for decision making. Most decision units uh, that we're sampling, sites we're sampling are very large, so one has to, can't scoop up all that soil for analysis, so you have to take a, a good representative sample of that uh, DU for making decisions on uh, contaminant levels. We have two basic uh, categories of decision units that we uh, typically employ. One are, are spill area de decision units, our source areas. These are areas where we have some reason to believe there, there was a specific release. So an example would, might be uh, a, a PCB next to a transformer that leaked off the pad onto a, the side of the transformer, a known release in which you're trying to uh, characterize, and other situations where we have uh, uh, oil spill areas that are obvious and identified and the like. Some, sometimes there'll be specific operations identified on a, on a piece of property, a former uh, USD site, a former uh, storage site for chemicals that are identified as these potential spill areas or source areas. These are, these are then identified as specific to use, generally small. We're trying to uh, focus in on what we know about the site and what we know about re past release areas on the site. So these are specifically identified as separate DUs and analyzed. And then oftentimes we're also setting up what we call perimeter DUs. Uh, these are basically just areas, uh, additional DUs uh, surrounding the areas that we suspect uh, as, the, as the release areas to uh, sample and ensure that we've captured our, our, our correctly corralled or identified the, the lateral extent of the contamination. Now, in many spill areas, we also have to focus on the, the vertical element as well. In some spill areas, we can have significant vertical intrusion of chemicals. So you're also having uh, a vertical ele element to each decision unit. And on these spill areas, you oftentimes have multiple vertical decision units uh, in that uh, in that lateral boundary area that you've identified as your, your spill area or source area DU. The other major category are exposure area DUs, and these are areas in which um, we don't have a specific, uh, a, a very specific release information, but there may be some, spec, some suspect of former chemical use on the property, say, it was former ag use, and there may have been uh, agricult agricultural chemicals used on the property in the past, or you're just wanting to sample this property and ensure there are no significant chemical con contamination in the area uh, uh, before proposed use. So these DUs are typically larger in size than the spill area DUs, and they're typically set by the, the land use or anticipated land use. Uh, a good example is uh, the size of the, the residential lots that might be going into an area. So uh, the exposure area DUs might be the size of the, of the residential lot, say in Hawaii anyway, that could be 5,000 square feet. Or, uh, or larger, depending on where, where you are. Or it could be even as specific as to the area of the backyard or, or in existing residential areas that are accessible and used uh, by the residents for uh, in their yard uh, over time. 
So they're site specific, uh, generally based on the, the land use and uh, used to confirm non-suspect areas as well as to check out areas where you, where you might have some suspicion, suspicion that there could have been some chemical use in the past. Some uh, additional decision unit basics. Again, the decision unit is the volume of soil or sediment or other media you would send to the lab as a single sample if you could. Now, as, as you know, in most cases, that's uh, entirely impossible. <laughs> so we have to take representative samples to uh, to get a representative average of the contaminant in that decision unit. The shape, area, and depth of the DUs are site-specific. These uh, illus illustrating on the left-hand side here are some source areas. This might be a good example of a, a transformer, a PCB transformer used to being on a pad and there was a, a, a known or a suspected leak off to the side of the pad. So this is a source area specifically targeting the area where the leak uh, would likely have occurred. And then uh, up here is a, a, a pond area where there was a release of contaminants or suspected. So again, that would be a specific targeted area. Where there wasn't a specific targeted area, say this is a portion of a, of, of a yard in which we're trying to confirm or the absence of chemicals or there may have been some suspicion, but we don't know where exactly, we'd stake out a, a larger DU in that area uh, or select a, a, a larger DU based on the, the yard area being used and, uh, as the selected DU. Here's an example in a co commercial industrial environment where the DU is selected in the, in the area in which the workers would uh, utilize uh, during uh, their their work and operations and it basically would be roaming across that entire area uh, to potentially get exposed uh, to any residues in the soil so that's a larger du and provides for are you were targeting what the average contamination is in that area that's utilized by employees at that commercial site again if there's specific sources like this there are always analyzed separate as a source or spill area DU. If there's no specific source identified, we generally have larger DUs that are based on uh, the land, land use type present. So uh, just this slide provides a basic visualization of our, our DU process in which we're identifying the target. In this case, it's an agricultural field area. We're laying out systematic random increments across that decision unit. And we typically have 30 to up to 100 DUs depending on the uh, chemical, uh, the amount of heterogeneity expected on the site, etc. These 30 to 100 increments are, are placed throughout the DU, stratified random locations. And in certain DUs, or at least a representative number of the DUs on a given site, we're, we're collecting triplicates. So we're going back in at separate uh, random locations, not these same ones. We don't do co-located samples, but we'll take separate stratified random locations located across the site, collect another 30 to 75 increments and do that again. So we have triplicate independent lab replicates on a site-specific basis on every invest, uh, investigation that to evaluate uh, error or, or the amount of precision in our sampling technique and, and defend our decisions. We can say we can go back in, sample separate stratified locations and, and get the same results within our within a reasonable variability. We typically uh, are shooting for a reproducibility within about 35% uh, for replicates. So if we get, uh, if our replicate data 
shows a relative standard deviation on the on the triplicate data of less than 35 percent, then uh, we call that uh, uh, good data for environmental sampling and utilizing that uh, RSD average for making decisions on the site. Another key part of the DUMIS is that those is that the uh, the samples are much different than the discrete samples and they're very large. We're collecting these 30 to 50 increments. We're usually collecting 30, 20 to 50 grams at each increment. So we're ending up with one to two kilogram samples. So these are large samples uh, that you're going to be collecting and sending into the lab as opposed to, uh, say, uh, just 20 or 30 grams or, or a small uh, six ounce jar for the uh, the old discrete sampling method. The larger samples, many increments, larger samples helps us get a, a much more representative uh, sample. Also, the laboratory has to follow through on on the whole uh, multi-increment sampling method. So the laboratory is typically taking the sampling, uh, drying it, air drying it, um, as, if, as long as these are non-volatile uh, contaminants. They're air drying it and then sieving it to less than two millimeters, which we define generally as soil-sized particles. And that keeps uh, the evaluation from one site to the next on the soil-sized particles. We also need to know the maximum particle size for the lab to select their subsampling mass uh, and reduce laboratory error. So for our less than two millimeter soil samples, the lab needs to then uh, subsample at least a 10, 10 gram subsampling mass out of, out of that bulk one to two kilogram sample uh, for analysis. These are uh, subsampled in the labs, very similar to how we sample them in the field. The lab will, after drying and sieving to less than two millimeters, will spread this sample out very thinly and take their subsampling increment increments at 30 or so locations across that spread out sample to make up their 10 grams, 50 grams or more of subsample that are then used for the analyses. This slide illustrates different exposure area decision units and, and notes that your decision units can vary depending on your site objectives and the size of those decision units can vary. Although the, the principle of sampling and how we sample those, choosing the number of increments um, across that DU, et cetera, stay largely the same and are independent of the size of the, of the decision unit. Again, whatever decision unit size is chosen, whether it's a large park uh, or neighborhood size, uh, if you're sampling 50 to 100 increments in here, you'll get the average level of contaminants in that park or neighborhood. And in some cases, that is the question that you're starting with or are working with. In other cases, you're targeting smaller DUs like yards for residential, evaluating residential exposures and even smaller areas in some cases like uh, the perimeters of buildings or uh, a backyard area in a yard or a sandbox where a kid is playing. Again, you'd apply the DU sampling methods uh, similarly to representatively, representatively sample the sandbox as you would in a park area. For uh, uh, ecological risk assessment, your decision unit may very well be the home range of a certain bird or reptile or, or other uh, critter uh, and your final analysis will be based on your ecological risk based on the home range of that animal. As you can see, the sizes and shapes vary, can vary dependent uh, can vary significantly and are uh, site-specific. So here's an example of, of applying the DU on a, a, a real site. In, this is in Hilo on the Hawaii Island. This was a former uh, wood treatment site. Uh, 
and arsenic and dioxin were the key contaminants on the former wood treatment site. Uh, outlined in red here was the main uh, former wood treatment site. So this was uh, treated as a separate decision unit because we're looking at arsenic and dioxin across the main area where that was involved in the wood treatment area. And then we've got smaller DUs that are perimeter type DUs around that to try to confirm that our arsenic and dioxin residues haven't spread out of the area that we suspect they're in and, and doing separate uh, DUs on, uh, around them to ensure that we've adequately determined the lateral extent of the contamination. Uh, many of these DUs were surface area DUs where we expected the contamination, but we also generally do uh, 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 at least one subsurface decision unit to ascertain that, that the uh, primary contamination was restricted to the uh, surface area. Now this site also entailed a, a railroad line that came in across, uh, across the site. And so these somewhat larger DUs were set out bracketing the former railroad right-of-way. And again, perimeter DUs set up outside the right-of-way to uh, bracket or uh, try to confirm that we've adequately captured any contamination that may have been in the, the railroad area. This small uh, DU designated here was a, an oil spill release that was very small and identified a specific area. So again, that was a source or spill area DU that was done separately and separately uh, analyzed. And then the rest of the property in which there was uh, no obvious suspected contaminants and was used for general uh, warehousing and, and other operations was uh, a larger DU, and this, these can oftentimes be up to an acre or so in size. And uh, so this was analyzed as a separate exposure area DU in a, in a larger uh, sample size. So this is putting together for a uh, more complex site different DUs to characterize the different environmental uh, the contaminants as well as uh, anticipated environmental concerns on the site. Um, for very simple sites, uh, one residential yard, of course, you'll have uh, just a single, could have just a single decision unit plus replicates if they're applicable. And, um, but for more complex uh, sites, you might have uh, uh, a number of DUs, in this case, more like 10 or 15 to cover the entire site. And they're in more complex uh, industrial sites like former sugar mills and the like, you may end up with 20, 30, 40 different decision units to characterize the range of chemicals and operations that used to occur on a, on a major uh, industrial site. Another type of uh, decision unit I've been talking about are perimeter. Uh, decision unit. Here's an, uh, a good example of a perimeter uh, DU around a building. We'll oftentimes target old, older building footprints or pads here around the edge of the pads where uh, lead paint that used to be used on the building may have sloughed off and fallen to the area outside the, the building foundation. Uh, Termaticides, if they, these were former wooden buildings, are oftentimes treated with chlordane and other chemicals along, uh, along the foundation and or underneath the building if it was accessible. So these would be, uh, the foundation area would be targeted for that reason. And in some cases, there was weed control around the edge of the building. In the old days, arsenic was used for um, weed control, so we will, we typically look for lead, arsenic, and termaticides or, or the organochlorine uh, pesticides in investigations of buildings. And then we'll set up these perimeter to use around the targeted area to uh, sample and ensure that um, we've adequately captured the lateral distribution of a significant contamination areas. So we'd be looking for these perimeter to use to be uh, clean or under our action limits um, and suspecting that these DUs uh, along the perimeter of the building 
might be contaminated with our suspect contaminants. Here's just an example set up in a drainage canal. So you might be sampling in ditches or uh, shallow sediment in drainage canals. This was a former sugar mill discharging into drainage canals and there was, we were wanting to look for uh, mercury or other chemicals that may have been used uh, in former days in the sugar mill in these drainage canals, setting up a, a, an initial DU uh, closest to the mill where we might suspect um, some of the majority of the uh, contamination may have remained and then additional DUs further down down gradient uh, to look for residues along the drainage canal. And in here's an example of applying our, our DUMIS principles to a subsurface area. Uh, subsurface areas are, are in any any scenario are more difficult to sample than surface samples, wh which we can usually access with hand tools. Uh, these are usually accessed with um, push, push devices, coring devices, that the like. But the same principles apply. A DU is a given volume of soil. We typically have a surface soil increment. And then uh, subsurface decision units uh, below that and we're designated the size of the decision ends. Now these, it's site specific, so in some cases these, these vertical depths of these decision units could be several feet long, uh, uh, whereas a surface increment is typically uh, fairly shallow. Uh, these subsurface inc increments could be two to four feet, something like that in some cases, depending on the chemicals of concern and, and site specific elements. So again, we have here in this example four different layers. Uh, this is just part of the core is shown, but you'd have uh, 30 cores through the DU. And for each of the layers, there'd be uh, uh, the core would be collected through the layers, cut into your different vertical depths, and then all these DUA layers would be combined into one sample, one large multi-argument sample. And if the core is large, these oftentimes have to be subsampled to add to the, the sample that goes to the lab, in the uh, subsampled in the field because of the mass is so large. But then all the cores from this increment would go into this um, DU sample and the like. There'll be much more, uh, as, uh, as we've mentioned before, tomorrow on DU examples and applying uh, DU and sampling in, in a variety of DUs, including these subsurface DUs. Here's another example where we typically have subsurface DUs as well as surrounding surface DUs, former pesticide mixing. In these areas, uh, gross contamination spills on the ground all the time typically result in deeper uh, contamination and so more vertical delineation uh, near the tanks. This oftentimes we've found significant contamination, uh, arsenic and dioxin down 10 feet depth in some of these former pesticide mixing areas. But as you go away from the pesticide mixing areas, it tend to be uh, surface runoff and uh, sh more shallow contamination, so we're typically using a, looking at a shallow surface area and then a subsurface decision unit to kind of uh, define and and delineate the contamination away from the the major spill area here on this site. And another. Another example here is given for sidewalls of an excavation and obviously a, a UST or some sort of a, a, ex, a contaminant excavation is a, is a good example for this. So uh, if you're suspecting uh, leaking primarily at the bottom of the DU, out of the bottom of the tank or source, then obviously your, your bottom area of that excavation would be your decision unit. Again, we would place stratified random increments across this DU get, and get a good representative average of the contaminant level across that entire uh, floor of the excavation. If 
if you had side vents or suspected contamination uh, release and going out to a side, you could then make that a separate decision unit on your sidewalls. Or if you had no suspicion on the sidewalls, perhaps combining all the sidewalls into one decision unit or uh, separating them out into one or uh, one, two, three, or four sidewall decision units, depending on uh, site specific information. And a final uh, basic example I'll give you is our stockpile decision units. So this is an area in which uh, trucks uh, had excavated a, an area in which was later uh, suspected of contamination, dumped these stockpiles and many, many piles across this large former agricultural area. And so to sample those um, areas, those stockpiles were uh, knocked down for access to the area and sampled in an area that was uh, uh, based on the planned uh, reuse of, of that soil. So in this case, in this particular example, this, the amount of soil or the size of the DU is based on uh, the amount of soil that would go in a worst case scenario in the top six inches in a residential lot. So that was the DU uh, volume was six inches deep. So that uh, each one of these then were sampled uh, for that uh, DU size and depth to characterize this, um, these, the stockpiles that were dumped here. We have, uh, in our guidance, we have default volumes for stockpiles. Again, as I mentioned, they're based on presumed reuse of the uh, soil. So in a worst case scenario, we assume that uh, a stockpile uh, could be utilized in a resident, small residential lot, 5,000 square feet, spread to a depth of six inches. So that would result <coughs> in a corresponding DU volume of about 100 cubic yards. For uh, more uh, intense uses, uh, commercial, industrial, or high density developments, that uh, those assumptions on, on thickness and acreages increase, therefore the DU, default DU volumes that we approve for stockpile sampling can be larger. And a, and a final example of a, of, a, of a considerable challenge in, in sampling is sampling of very large uh, areas. <laughs> and we've had a number of examples here in Hawaii where a former ag land was purchased several thousand acres and uh, was to be developed into residential or so, uh, mix of commercial and industrial uh, residential uses. Therefore, we're faced of uh, the daunting task of trying to characterize contamination over these very large areas and, and uh, making reasonable decisions on the, the uh, contamination of, of the property and strategies that we can adequately um, try to represent this. And then, excuse me, then uh, as, as the properties increase, we have less and less insurance or there's less of the total property being analyzed as you go larger and larger here. So we're adding in as we get above 118 acres, we're adding in a what we call a baseline investigation which is a, a, an initial investigation where we're breaking up the property into large uh, neighborhood size areas and analyzing those first, doing representative samples for those neighborhood areas to look for broad patterns of uh, contamination, large contaminated areas, as well as looking at uh, certain contaminants that might pop up in those, um, in those large areas to include in the investigation. Again, phase Phase one is conducted in every case, and in, if that phase one reveals any area where there's a source or spill area, those are analyzed totally separate as separate DUs in addition to the DUs we're talking about here in the baseline investigation um, or the 59 randomly located. So in these, this large area, we're doing 
both the baseline investigation and then within those areas we're as above we're locating 59 randomly located areas uh, one acre DUs again to uh, look for uh, contamination at that scale and finally in the very uh, very large sites and and these are pretty uncommon but they do come up occasionally we'll do both the phase one ESA to look for uh, source area, spill area DUs, the baseline investigation, so looking at uh, a number of DUs, uh, neighborhood uh, uh, size across that property first to look for uh, wider scale or larger scale contamination and contaminants of concern. Then we'll pump up the uh, randomly located one acre DUs to 90, so we're getting a little bit better coverage as we go up to this larger acreage. So moving right along in our in our uh, investigation procedure here, our sampling analysis plans. Of course, uh, these are similar to sampling analysis plans that are have been used uh, for a long time in in environmental investigations. With the exception that we're incorporating the DUMIS approaches, so they'll be incorporated and included in your. Uh, sampling analysis plan. So we, we're expecting maps of DUs that have been selected, uh, lists of chemicals of potential concern for those DUs, lists of the size of those DUs, uh, the number of increments that are going to be used in those DUs, the sampling tools that will be utilized to make sure that correct sample shape is being uh, collected, which is a core shape is what we're shooting for. And then, of course, good maps summarizing the location of the DUs and, uh, and tables with DU-specific information, the size of the DUs, the depth of the each DU, the volume, number of increments per sample, et cetera. So we'll have all those details and can review that before the actual sampling occurs and make sure that it's um, in line with our uh, DUMIS investigation procedures. And uh, of course, the sampling plan includes a summary of all chemicals of potential concern, uh, what, the, what environmental hazards are associated with those chemicals, and our listed default tier one EALs for those chemicals and environmental hazards, and the laboratory information, lab analysis method, lab detection limits, and the, and the like. Now, because it's critical that the laboratory follow through with the MIS processing and subsampling procedures, we also, uh, it's very important that the lab uh, share their MIS SOPs for processing these large uh, multi-increment samples for us, and that those details are also uh, included in the sampling analysis plans. In data quality assessment, again, a key part of, of any environmental in investigation and has been for a long time. A key part of this is that we have uh, uh, true field replicate data, triplicate samples on every site-specific investigation to evaluate, to evaluate error and or precision, however you want to talk about that in the sample data, and ensure that we've got uh, good reproducibility that we're getting uh, the right average level of contamination in the DUs that, that we select. Now this is, uh, we don't do replicates in every decision unit as a practical basis. We take uh, sort of a batch approach like, like a laboratory uh, will do. As you know, in laboratories they'll do 10% or 20% of their samples they'll do the QC and replicate um, data on to evaluate uh, it would take a similar approach in the in the field with these uh, replicate data, and we'll do at least 10%. Um, but that has to be in a similar soil type, similar characteristics. Or I'll, if they're different, then uh, replicates have to be conducted in in those different scenarios as well. If you have different chemicals, you need replicates to represent all the different chemicals in different DUs and the like. So uh, it 
uh, initial 10% could, could be more depending on the site-specific information. And this is a key important part of our multi-increment data. We've got the data, uh, we'll provide site-specific data on, on every investigation on the precision of the data so that um, you can defend this data uh, and show that in your data quality assessment. And the lab does the same thing. They're taking replicates on their subsampling, uh, uh, potential subsampling era. They have to get a representative sample out of that one to two kilogram sample that you send to the lab. So that's, that's a challenge for them. Like I say, they have to do multi-increment sampling in the lab to do that. And they'll do uh, two or three replicates of that uh, in the lab to ensure that, that the replicate data meets their laboratory criteria for uh, good or precise samples. And we, we always like to see the final data, the concentrations of chemicals of concern uh, located or, or put on a map with the DUs. So you'd be pointing to the DUs and pointing to those where the uh, chemical con con concentrations are over our applicable action limits. So we can zero in on a map on, on both the DUs and the data that have that's significant for, for the, any further evaluation. Site investigation reports uh, include your initial DQOs for the site and most notably information on the selection of decision unit, units, uh, tables with details on those decision units, the size, the depth, the number of increments, etc. So that we can, uh, the department checks these reports and make sure that the representative sampling methods were employed and that the uh, final uh, data is representative of the site. As I mentioned, uh, figures locating the DUs, locating information within those DUs are, are a significant part of those site investigation reports. And in the data assessment element of that, will be, uh, it's critical to include an assessment of the field uh, data as well as the laboratory replicate data as part of your, your data assessment. And in our, in our state, the final step in our site investigation uh, process and reports is our, what we call our environmental hazard evaluation in which the representative sampling data is compared with our environmental action levels and um, any exceedances of our applicable levels are identified and then uh, go from, from those, any exceedances, what conclusions are made in terms of the need for any additional investigation or remediation for the site. Our we have a separate uh, TGM technical guidance manual section on environmental hazard evaluation and a separate uh, document, as I mentioned earlier. This is a TGM section 13. And it's important that uh, we have this EHE report for all, all sites. And so it's typically included as part of the site investigation report, but could be a separate document. Um, I, again, the EHE compares the site data, the representative site data to our action levels or if we have site-specific risk assessment uh, information, compares it with that and identifies potential environmental hazards and then makes a conclusion in terms of need for additional site inf investigation or whether the site will be determined below action levels and, and um, no further action necessary. Okay, thanks you, thank you for your attention here. I wanted to remind you that tomorrow will be our next uh, short webinar led by Roger Brewer, and that'll be an in-depth discussion on the designation of decision units, uh, presenting lots of examples. And so be sure and stay tuned for that.